Ghost Pottern Podcast. Uh, today, our guest is Andrew Cow. Andrew is a licensed architect with ex experience in residential, institutional, and commercial projects. I think what's really fascinating about Andrew's career is that he's taken this experience in the companies like WeWork, CBRE, Miller Knoll, where he really took on non-traditional roles in product, services, and design. Welcome, Andrew. Thank you, guys. Excited Welcome to be here. here. Welcome. Awesome. And I think this is always the question that we start off with, especially this season. Um, but to kind of help us understand what set you on this path, can you tell us a little bit about what first attracted you to architecture? Okay, so we'll, we'll go like full origin story. Um, there, there, there's a moment of epiphany for me, which is very rare, right? Like, I feel like actually moments of epiphany are very rare in your life. Like most of the time you're lost in some kind of gray area. But I was sitting in organic chemistry. I was, it was my sophomore year uh, in college. I was an organic or I was a chemistry major and green bed. And I was going hardcore at that stuff. And I just was sitting there. I was like, I absolutely hate this stuff. Like, this is the stupidest stuff ever. And I just, I, I just couldn't get excited about it. I, I like missed a test and like, I was just, it was a very rare. Like I was a good student. Like I found it very challenging to like, bring myself to class for the first time in my life. But meanwhile, I had, our school has a really fantastic, or I went to Williams College, we have a very fantastic art history program. And I, you're like, one of the things is you just take art history 101, 102, because it's just a, a fantastic primer, the professors are great, it's, it's just a great way to get, you know, a, a well rounded education. So I was taking that art history 102 is focused on sculpture and architecture. And I just found myself glued to the textbook, like for the one of the few times ever. Like I, like I said, I've always been a decent student. I study what I need to do, I got good grades, but like this is the first time I really felt like attached to a textbook, and that was just exciting to read about and learn more about. And I was like, wait, this is just the light bulb went off in the middle of organic chemistry that I, I didn't, I don't have to do this. Like I could literally, I had choice and agency in this. And as I could make a change and I could just study more of what I enjoyed studying and like, it just never had dawned on me, which seems really like, I, I'll fully admit, I was probably very naive and very young and very stupid, but suddenly it just like clicked and I was like, that's amazing. I can just do this. <laughs> and so I, it, it was instantaneous. I kind of like changed the coursework for the next semester, completely pivoted, dropped my major in, 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 um, chemistry and dropped the pre-med and was for full board kind of, we didn't have an architecture program, but art history, um, but studying a lot of obviously theory and architectural history and our, our architectural history at that point. So that, that's kind that, of the start of it. What was it though, that specifically that attracted you so much to it? I mean, obviously Orgo versus art history is complete, completely different. Is it the creative side? Is it the, is it the actual theory, the history, the, the legacy? Yeah, I think that the thing that the art history class gave me was obviously you get a broad view of architecture. And the fact that like somebody was helping weave this narrative throughout different phases of different architectural styles and the way that things were practiced, and that was connected to technology, right? Like understanding the movement of, of kind of like Gothic to Romanesque and the round arch and the development of technology around that, then the development of iron. Uh, bracing, getting rid of some of the, the structural uh, requirements that stone needed. It, it's just, there's so many aspects of it that it was, just, it was such a interesting way of weaving together all these things. And obviously architecture is like a very good kind of slight uh, snapshot of the culture of the, uh, of the, the powers, the political powers at that time. And so th th all these factors were weighing in on it. It was just such a fun way. And I think this is just my brain's one of those things that I have to jump from one thing to another. I'm just ping ponging around all the time. And it felt like, oh, there's a, there's a topic out there that really just neatly fits into how my brain works and that I don't have to be pigeonholed into, okay, you know, chiral carbons are rotated by plain polarized light. And so when you have, uh, you know, this ion coming in on this, like to me, that was so abstract and intangible. Whereas like this felt so real and visceral. And the fact that like, especially, you know, colleges, college campuses are great places to experience architecture and to think about those things. And one of the things that are, I think 
I really liked about our college campuses. We, we don't have a consistent architectural style at Williams College. It's you design in the style of the time. So there was this natural history that was being told through the architectural styles for, and it's, it's a, you know, 250 year old college. So like, it was amazing to kind of just like, oh, like I could connect the dots everywhere. And it just felt right. It, it, everything just kind of fell into place at that point. Um, so that that's really what kind of clicked with me. Yeah. So always the first part is how you fell in love with architecture at school. But then there's always <laughs> the second part of going to practice. Uh, what was yeah. it like uh, after you graduated and went into practice? So I, so well, graduated undergrad in 2004. I worked for a few years um, before I went to my master's program. I went to UCLA for my master's program, got my three-year degree there and graduated in 2009. And that was just obviously 2009 was just like when everything was hitting rock bottom. So it was scary because coming out like we in second year in 2008, we saw the bottom fell out. I saw people like people got job offers in the class ahead of us. And those firms vaporized in front of our eyes, like people that were at, you know, 100, 120 person firms that were cut down to like a dozen people overnight. And so it, it was kind of crazy to see. And then we graduate into that environment and you're just like, oh my God, like, what am I going to do? And I, I think it was, uh, I'll, I'll chalk it up to luck and, and, you know, obviously a little bit of grit, but found enough odd jobs here and there and working for professors and working for a couple small firms and doing odds and ends. And I, I think it's luckily, luckily too, I don't, I didn't realize it at the time, but you know, when you're inexperienced, you're kind of actually, you've, you've got the most flexibility and you have the most optionality in terms of getting a job because everywhere you go, you can, you can contribute something. You don't cost anything. So you actually can, I found enough opportunities and it required, I was in LA, I moved to New York for a year. I moved back to San Francisco and California for another year. I moved back to New York a year later. So it really required a lot of ping ponging around and kind of just scraping by and trying to gain as much experience as I could. But luckily things obviously settled out after a few years and kind of found my way to a firm in New York. Where was that? Uh, that was a, a firm called Sage and Coombe. So we were doing a lot of institutional work and public civic work at the time, which was, it, it's interesting because like the, the pace of that work is so much slower than a lot of other work too. But to me, it was a really great because the stakeholder groups are really broad. So it gave me a lot of experience kind of doing the meetings, running those meetings, sitting in those meetings, doing a lot of meetings with uh, different interest groups that, that had a stake in it that not necessarily were clients, but had a say, especially with the public work, like you have to go to so many presentations. And so it was, it was kind of a good thing to go through all the red tape because when you do do a project that isn't a public project, it feels fast and, and easy and it feels so much more, more the shackles are off at that point. So, but I think it's, it's really useful to have that kind of experience because there are projects that exist like that. And if you, if you don't have the experience doing it, it just feels like such a slog. Did interfacing with the public, basically non-architects, um, you know, they might've had deciding power on a lot of the things you're doing. Did that change your opinion of architecture or change your perspective after coming from architecture school? Yeah, I think especially not so much of like the relationship between architecture and the public, but just in how architecture actually gets executed. I think so much of your training and the pedagogy in architecture school is about process of design, right? And what you find out is in so many different projects, that's maybe what 10 to 20% if you're lucky of what you're doing on any given project. And the rest of the time is all the other stuff that needs to happen in order for it to actually get realized into form. And to me that I, I, I think it, it's both, it's super elucidating because you realize, oh, like to be a successful architect, to actually realize built work, it takes so much more. And it's one thing to be a paper architect and publish a lot of things and present and go to conferences and talk about things, but to actually build work and especially work that looks like what you set out for it to look like when there's massively complex, like I think it gave me a deeper appreciation of the architects who are actually very successful at that, right? That can do that work and actually execute it. And so it looks like what they actually set out to do. I think it's so, so easy to fall into the trap of, okay, I'll, I'll compromise. I'll, I'll kind of concede different points and kind of let the architecture by committee happen. 
And it's so hard to kind of hold on to the core ideas that you're trying to execute, really advocate for them and convince people wholeheartedly. It's so easy, you know, six, 12, 24 months down the line after just talking about over and over that you're still trying to convince people. Um, so I, I think that was really a valuable experience for me to kind of see that. And it, it gave me a deep appreciation of kind of the real built work that practicing architects do. Well, that's so powerful. I mean, I, I also relate to that. I only feel that I got that experience by switching to development because I was in such mo most on the conceptual and schematic design side for a yeah. while. Um, and I get to see all the complexities and the difficulties and the fact that how difficult it is to have people engage and agree to your project. Yeah. So, yeah, it's great that you had that experience early on. Yeah, but it's it's a steep learning curve. And I think that's, there's a big frustration with that too, because it feels like you're, you're banging your head against the wall on so many things. And I also think like, that's what it, you, you kind of spiral a little bit with the design because you're, you're, you get all this feedback. You're kind of in this, your blinders up, you're in this kind of siloed area where you're like trying to incorporate all of it. And, and it's really dis discombobulating. And I think sometimes once you have kind of a broader perspective, especially outside of architecture, once you go onto the, if you're on the owner side or developer side, like you get, you get a broader perspective. And sometimes that it's really challenging to balance the narrowness of kind of the architectural scope and focus versus the larger implications of the project. Yeah. Like you alluded to, um, there is some frustrations with uh, being an architect, but I guess for you, when did you feel like a change was needed that kind of precipitated your move into WeWork? I, I think it's not so much of a, I didn't like hit a breaking point or like something's got to change. To me, it was really mm -hmm. kind of the work I was doing. So we were doing a lot of public work. I was cutting my teeth on that kind of stuff. And then I started doing a couple projects just purely by luck. And I, looking back at like my career, I think I, I have to say like luck factors into so many things because just it's the circumstances and the cards that you're dealt. And then it kind of just, you, you try to wrap some kind of narrative or some kind of, and to me, the narrative isn't something that I'm trying to force. It's just really like, I, I need to make sense of it. So I need to rationalize it somehow. So to me, constructing the narrative, isn't something that is like, um, I, I'm not trying to write some grand, uh, novel about architecture, but I'm just trying to make sense of my career. So I was working on a lot of prefabricated projects. Um, and then projects at scale. So one was an infrastructural project for a department of environmental protection for New York city who does all the water distribution. And they were looking at kind of different, they have actually about 30 some odd well sites across Queens. Um, there's a massive aquifer under Queens. They were really concerned about kind of the infrastructure because most of the city water from New York comes from the Hudson comes from upstate and it's kind of pumped down. Um, they wanted to make sure they had a backup system. And so they were going to reactivate all these wells. So the question was, okay, if we're going to build all this infrastructure, what does the architecture look like? How do we accommodate all of it? So it was this interesting kind of kit of parts approach that we took and, and looking at, okay, like how do you design 30 very, each site is a little bit different. The, the components at each site have to be a little bit different, but there was probably like about six or seven different modules. Um, and certain ones had different combinations of in permutations of those modules. And so we kind of came up with an architecture kind of responded to that, which was kind of this fun exercise in systems of architecture deployed across multiple sites. Um, similarly too, so we actually won the ideas competition for the New York city payphone replacement. The, um, the, you, you see them across, uh, New York now as those kind of digital billboards with the tiny little keypad on the side of it. But we won the ideas competition around that, which was kind of this really fun, exciting moment about infrastructure and kind of street, what we call street furniture. Um, and developing those things. So again, like these things are not just one thing, but something that's prototypical and that can be deployed across multiple sites. And so it really got my brain thinking about like scale and like the interesting things that happen when you start thinking about architecture that way, because so much of architecture, like it's, it's just one offs, right? It's one project at a time, one site, one client, and you get so kind of focused on that. So to me, this was just like, oh, this is really interesting. How do you pursue this? And then it was so much fun to see like, oh, the work that I do now gets multiplied by, you know, 30 X, 50 X, hundred X. And that's like, feels really exciting and powerful. So, um, I just happened to have some friends that were working at, we work doing some contract work. And so they made some introductions for me and I just kind of fell into this opportunity where they were like, okay, yeah, 
we're hiring a product manager and why don't you come on board? And like, I had no idea really what a product manager really meant uh, in an incapacity, whether outside, like not even in a digital, like, you know, um, uh, a tech industry perspective at all, but I, I was excited about it. And cause it was just the, the news had hit, you know, they had gotten the soft bank funding. This was 2016. So they got literally a check written for billions of dollars. And they were like, we're going to build, you know, hundreds of things, these things like all around the world, super fast. And it was like, okay, that sounds interesting. And to me, the multiplicity part was the interesting part. Like to me, office space is like actually pretty straightforward. Like, sure. There's all sorts of little decisions that you have to make around it, but the parts and pieces of an office, like are not overtly complex. And so it was this interesting thing. It was like, okay, this is actually a good problem. Like you don't have to bend over backwards. It's not really difficult to solve the, the prototypical case, but then like, it's about the scaling. It's about the, the multiplicity of it. And what are the challenges with that? How do you do that across the board? So I got really excited about that. So that's how I kind of jumped on board at WeWork. Yeah. So at WeWork, you worked on standards, um, which is both, I think at that time was a part of a CapEx effort. So how do you uh, reduce the cost it takes to build a WeWork, but at the same time, uh, build more consistency and also speed of deployment for this massive scale that we were about to go into. So can you talk a little bit about what it's like to, I guess, be an architect for hundreds of locations? I think the, the key to me is like this, and this goes for all projects at scale, not just for a, a co-working space. To me, it's, it's this balance. Like if you're overly prescriptive, right, that, that carries risk, right? Because when there's an exception thrown at you, you don't know how to handle those exceptions. And then secondly, too, I think from an architectural perspective, very, I think this balance between repetition and variation is really important. I think we reckon repetition has its own kind of aesthetic value. Like if you look at kind of capital M modernism, like that is entirely built on repetition, right? There is an aesthetic value to it. Um, I mean, Herzog and Demeron cut their teeth entirely on repetition, right? Like then in kind of multiplicity, but uh, Herzog and Demeron do a really great job of kind of introducing variation to that, right? And I think a lot of the, the contemporary architect taking a lot of lessons from capital M modernism and mid-century modernism, but then kind of layering in the technologies that we have and building construction opportunities that we have is it, you introduce kind of mod, uh, kind of tweaks to it. Parametricism is obviously heavily tied to this and gives you a lot of opportunities at that. So I think to me, there was this kind of interesting opportunity to kind of weave all those things together. So I think going back to the original question though, but around on our standards, it's, it's this balance of those things. Like how do you create opportunities and for, for creativity to rise, for a designer to take liberties, how do you create a rule set that imbues kind of efficiency in the process? So if I'm a designer and we obviously had, you know, a massive in-house design team working on these loca individual locations as projects, how do you create kind of a, a rule set? How do you create best practices that allow people to quickly absorb that knowledge and information, digest it, and then quickly deploy that to a specific permutation of that. And I think that that creates variation, which can respond to local things that, that I'm not aware of as kind of the system uh, designer of it. But so you can, you want to make sure you can build all those things together. But at the same time, obviously, from a cost perspective, repetition helps you drive down cost. Um, the speed of delivery obviously was incredibly important for, for WeWork at that time. So how do you do this concisely? How do you write these kind of rules concisely? How do you create documents and tools that people can leverage really easily? So to me, that that's such a fun problem too, because like, it's an architect's problem. Like I think all of us in pra that have practiced, like you spend so much of your time doing actually very mundane things. Like if I'm in Revit, like, do I have the right Revit families for me to design the space? And like, how much time do I spend looking for the right Revit family to find the wrong Revit family and then editing it and then customizing it so I can actually use it. And it's like incredible amount of time is spent on that. And the worst part is like, you toss it away for the next project, right? It's like, okay, well, I was working on a school and now I'm doing a single family residence. So like, all this is meaningless now. And by the time you get back to it, like, or you haven't done a good job even documenting it or, or archiving it in the right way. Um, cause you were just on that kind of project grind. You were on, you were trying to meet your deadline. So to me, this was like this amazing opportunity, all those things, like you could solve those problems for your colleagues. And so that like, oh, these libraries exist, these tools exist, these 
the documentation exists. Um, one of the things, going back to kind of some of your original premise around the first question about the transition, I, I do think one of my biggest frustrations about the architecture industry, and part of it is, I, I get it, it's about like IP. Um, a lot of it does come out of kind of this master apprentice kind of approach in architecture, which architecture is one of the oldest professions. So of course it comes out of the guilds. It comes out of this notion of like, okay, I'm going to teach you how to do it, but you have to cut your teeth, you pay your dues. But I think that runs counter to a lot of how knowledge is acquired these days and technology has really enabled, right? So much of it just as freely enabled or is, is out there. And if you're willing to put in the time and just read and learn and try it, like it's all out there for the taking. And it's so much more satisfying in some ways because like you don't have to spend so much time like I'm waiting for the opportunity to learn how to draw a window detail so I can properly learn how to where the flashing goes and where where the waterproofing goes. And like it it felt so liberating to be like, oh, like I can share the knowledge now. And because it was a large organization, you're sharing it with a lot of people. I think that there's always this reticence like when I share it more openly with a broad audience, like I'm just giving my knowledge away for free. And I think that's like, I definitely admire like open source kind of projects in the software world. The fact that people develop very, very complex and intricate things and just put it out there for free, right? Because they know that it's going to be useful to somebody else. I think, I think that's something that as a, as a discipline, we should admire and also take it, take to heart because we're so it's funny, you go to any small firm and they're like, oh, this is our, our detailed library and like it's super secret and like we we don't want to share it with other people. But it's like you're a small like four person firm. It's like I don't think your details are any better than any other, you know, small firms. out there. Like, I don't know what you're trying to hide at a certain point. <laughs> so that, those are the kinds of things that kind of were exciting for me is about sharing knowledge. And like this is an opportunity to do it across a broad yeah. audience. I have a quick question. Just, just so that I can relate more, and maybe the listeners can relate more. What, what is standards? Is it like a set of documents or a book that you give out to the satellite offices or wherever they need uh, to the new construction sites where we yeah. need to build what we work? And I'll be honest, like it, it was the first time I worked on any set of design standards or basis of design or any documentation like that. Uh, like if you go to most like you know chain brands that have kind of retail operations, they have their own kind of. Uh, brand standards across that. And it was an evolving thing too, because I think the first realization was like, look, we're designing a ton of these. These were done kind of ad hoc in the beginning, less one-offs. And we obviously need to get our act together if we're going to do, you know, 100, 200, 300 of these a year, right? So the question was, okay, let's let's start just by documenting like what what's kind of the accepted best practice, right? So it really started about just figure out like what is it that we work and how do we typically design it now and like internally what does that documentation looks like look like like how do i know what a typical meeting room should should be right like as obviously there's a ton of knowledge over designing the first you know 80 of them i joined i think at like 80 locations roughly across mostly just the us at that point um by the time i left i think we were at like 800 locations so it was like a crazy journey from that perspective but the standards document was because this living document essentially is like, okay, this is what is the best practice. And originally it was actually intended at in-house audience, but as we grew and it got more sophisticated, it became, there are kind of different layers of it. And I think of it different kind of filters on the same information, but we would share with our consultant teams as well, um, the GC as well. And it just helped manage expectations around things. And uh, we got to a point where we were considering, you know, your traditional master spec uh, documentation along with that for people that were familiar with that format. And so it was really interesting. It's, it, it, it became this exercise and kind of, okay, what, what are best practices or standard practices that are out there? How do we communicate our in design intent as succinctly and easily as possible to the different audiences that have to play with us such that we can make this process much more efficient. And because we held the purse strings as kind of the, the, the owner developer on some of, some of it, it, it was so satisfying to see like, okay, but you can actually move the needle on these things. You can actually build and design these things super quick. Um, so for all the negative things said about WeWork, I do think a couple of things to me, I, I have to say, you know, first and foremost, I think the product was good. We delivered the product that the customers wanted. 
and they they found value in that and they paid for it and got exactly what they paid for. Nobody ever was felt like defrauded by WeWork from that perspective. And then secondly, we we deploy these things at an incredible scale and speed with a consistency that I think is actually quite good. Um, and then the iteration on that to me also was this amazing opportunity because so much of the architecture profession, right? The projects are slow, right? Even, even a fast project is 18, 24 months from start to finish. And so the, if you're just in, maybe you work on four or five projects a year, if you're really, really busy and really capable about juggling all those kind of things. So over, you know, 10 years, you, you get maybe 40, 50 reps in. And at this point at WeWork, we were getting, you know, 40, 50 reps in every couple months. Right. <laughs> and like, that's the iteration speed. And when you think about it, as trite as it's, you know, Malcolm Gladwell's like 10,000 hours and whatever, like that's what you need. And to, uh, going back to my, my comment around knowledge acquisition and like the, the, you get to a point where you feel a little bit frustrated. Like, I don't feel like I'm learning as much as I could be learning. And to me, the, getting those repetitions in, and then secondly, being on the side of the operator of the space, you actually got to see the space in action and how it worked. And that was also really illuminating. So you began to become much more iterative in your design. We talk about iteration design, but really that's just talking about the iterations of the actual design process, but not actually about how you improve design more broadly. And to me, there was this amazing ability for us to, okay, we built 10 of these things. We see how they're working, what's working, what's not working. So now we're going to make a change and we change the standard and we'd look at new products. We'd look at new, you know, construction techniques. We'd look at new assemblies. Like to me, that was just, or, or even just be documenting something better. So people understood it better. Like those were, it was such an amazing opportunity to do that at lightning speed and do it over and over and over and over. Um, so within just, you know, a few years, we had written probably like 12, you know, iterative uh, improvements on those standards, covering more and more territory too. Um, by the time I left, I think we were covering 18 different countries and had localized standards for those 18 different countries. Wow. That's fascinating. I think speaking of open source knowledge, um, if there's a book about WeWork standards, I would love to buy one. <laughs> who, who owns that? Who owns that knowledge? I, I, well, maybe it's up for sale right now with the bankruptcy. So mm. maybe you can bid <laughs> on it all. Ourselves. Yeah, so, I'd love to. I think that's, yeah. that's a good book. But to, to me, like that was such a, that was actually a really eye-opening moment around the practice. Like it was so satisfying to be able to be like, oh, hey, we have a better way of doing it. And hey guys, this is why, and this is the documentation and that we had the time to document something as the, and the, the why on the documentation. I think so much of it going back to kind of the, the, the detail library example, like you get a detail library and you're like, Okay, but I don't. I understand where things go and the the what the drawing tells me, but I don't know the why behind it, right? Like, why is this the 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 detail that we use, and why did we decide these things? And to me, that's kind of this this amazing opportunity. And I I I, I hope that technology in the future enables our 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 colleagues to to help better document this because I think that'll start to add a lot more value into the profession. So much of it kind of is still shrouded in kind of mystery. Um, and just kind of, this is the way to do it, um, without the explanation why. And I, I think it's so helpful to have that explanation. I think if, if you go online now, like there's so many more forms available for, for you to trade that information, it's, it's getting better, but I think there's, it, we're still in early stages for, for that as an opportunity. Well, that's part of what we're trying to do, uh, is share knowledge for free over, over our podcast episodes. Um, so I guess you alluded a little bit to the fact that you left WeWork, um, which is a company that still exists, but is going through bankruptcy. You took your talents to a much larger company, much more established in the real estate world, CBRE, um, where you kind of took a leadership position in starting a subsidiary called HANA, which for the lack of a better word is also a co-working company. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what experiences or learnings you brought to HANA and what it was it like to, I guess, start a company inside of a big company? So uh, obviously I think it was, it's obviously an, anytime you get another chance to kind of wipe the slate clean and be like, Hey, your mistakes are forgiven and start over. Like 
I, I think you have to take those opportunities, especially if they're giving you kind of a lot of agency to correct those kind of things like that, that just never comes along. So to me, like that was just kind of this, again, like I have to credit, like I just got lucky in, in many ways that this opportunity came up, it came to me and I was able to kind of say yes to it. Um, and it really was kind of like, okay, even at the, sp at the speed we were moving and kind of the agility that we had at WeWork, like you make mistakes, things become institutionalized. And even the, the, the kind of the political boundaries start to get established in certain ways where, okay, even if I'm responsible for the standards and I, and I, and I'm pushing things in one direction or another, like there are like other elements at play. And so this was kind of a nice to start over, wipe the slate clean, wipe, wipe the slate clean of all the politics that are involved. And I think this is going foreshadowing a little bit, like no matter what organization you had politics eventually kind of come into play. So like there's, I think that that was kind of a, a realization of, of doing this again, that was really healthy to kind of go through. Um, but making smart choices, understanding how to be lean about things, right? Because I think so much of the financial pressures that we work is under now, like that, the writing was on the wall in 2019 when I left, like that wasn't, that wasn't an obvious inside of we work. And so, so much of that is like, okay, if we're going to do this again, like, how do we make sure we do it efficiently? And again, like what we were trying to do with all the documentation of all these things is create efficiency, right? Allow people to be efficient. And I think we, we leveraged that. We, we did a great job kind of launching that and, remain kind of small. We didn't hire a ton of people. We kind of had a small team working on this. So we could, again, move kind of quickly, but so much of the learning, so much of those kind of how to document these things, how to share it with your, your consultant team, how to share that with kind of the contractors that you work with. And then also because I, I got elevated at CBRE um, HANA, like I had much more connectivity to kind of the C-suite of, of that organization and make sure that the value of what we were doing um, was kind of established. And to me, like the big opportunity there is when you have a really solid design team in kind of any kind of, and let's call it a development opportunity for lack of a better term, um, design work that happens at the forefront can actually de-risk a project greatly, right? And if you if you hold to what you are trying to do, it it just makes the the, the path to completion that much easier and so that's where I think we had a lot of success. Like we could design them really quickly. The way that we phased the design was such that we could de-risk it. We could, we could kind of figure out the, the problems and the, the risks inherent in it, acknowledge them, and then kind of continue to move forward. And we were really good about trying to stay on track of what we planned to do. So it was really effective in making sure we could land projects on budget. And this is, you know, 2019, 2020, I think this is the opportunity, obviously the economy was booming at the time. So everything was getting expensive, right? Mm -hmm. Like every contractor, I think everybody in the business knows that like getting a contractor at that point was next to impossible. Everybody could, you know, pick and choose their projects. So costs were skyrocketing, labor costs were skyrocketing. And obviously we, we ran headlong into um, the pandemic too, right? So commodity prices through the roof. Like, I think we all have stories about like what we, anybody paid for wood on a project at that point or what getting, you know, any product from China, how long that took. So like it, we, I think through that time, we still sort of stayed on track because we had that. The other thing too, is I think we established such good kind of mechanisms of communication and documentation around our team that even when we fully went remote um, and I'll fully acknowledge, like Lebo kind of called this. And I, I actually, uh, when we were working, I think it was probably what early March that basically everybody made the call to like stop going into offices. Lebo kind of was like, we really need to watch out for this. And like, I, I was like, okay, guys, like, we're just going to prep for it, take everything home now. Like, and we did this a week before everything shut down. And it was really prescient too. And so, but the fact that we had everything kind of online, we had really good digital tools, we were well set up. It really felt like we didn't miss a beat. And I'll acknowledge like we had a, our lean and small team was really effective too, because we, we all knew each other, we trusted each other. We didn't have to go through a lot of hoops to communicate well with each other. Everybody understood kind of documentation, the tool set and the process that was available. So it really felt like we didn't have to miss a beat in moving remote. And I know a lot of teams kind of that weren't set up to do so kind of struggled with that initially. 
Yeah, so you alluded to it a little bit, but I think we all know that what happens during a pandemic for co-working spaces. Um, so <laughs> after Hannah, you went to Herman Miller, um, and right at the time, Herman Miller became Miller Null. Uh, so can you yeah. tell us a little bit about uh, what kind of precipitated that leap and what was your experience like at Herman Miller? So, uh, well, to, to kind of sunset the chapter on on Hana. Obviously, we we built uh, you know about a dozen locations, both here in the UK, did decently well on them. But obviously, the pandemic put a damper on everything. Um, CBRE was opt opportunistic, and I I think they did the right thing. They made a massive investment in Industrious at that point, which already had many many locations, um, and was looking for for additional investment. And frankly, like any co working company, probably was looking for capital at that point. So I think. We, we merged the businesses together. So Hana Industrious and merged. And to me, I, I kind of went through that process and I, I felt like, okay, I might want to step away from flexible workspace or co-working for a little while. I felt like, okay, I, I've been in this for like, you know, five, six years at this point. And I, I was ready to kind of tackle something a little bit different, obviously leveraging what I've done. Um, we had been doing a lot of work with Miller Knoll as kind of a, a, a client of theirs. Um, and so I got to know the team well there, and they just happened to be looking for uh, a, a VP of workplace uh, services and design there, which kind of leads a consultant group internally there of uh, interior designers, uh, workplace strategists, and that kind of, and, and uh, also some architects too, um, that offer services to their clients. So it just happened to be a good fit. I jumped over there. This, this was right as they announced their um, merger with Knoll. So to me, it was like an exciting M and A kind of opportunity to go through that, like really kind of own a team. And this was a much larger team at this point. I think we had like thirty to forty people at the at the highest point. Um, and so it was it was really educational for me. Okay, this is also a very well established company. Like I've taken my skill set, like at high growth company at WeWork, something from the ground up over at CBRE Hana, and then now it's like okay, now I'm inheriting an entire team. To me, this was a very different kind of challenge. It's like, okay, I, I know I can build it from scratch, but if I'm jumping, I'm the new person. Everybody else has been here for some, some people have been there for decades, right? What are we doing? How, how do I kind of get my bearings in this? How do I kind of put this team together? And so a lot of it was to like, okay, once they, we, we acquired Noel, like, what is the team? Who are these people coming on board? Like, how do we sort through it? Make sense of these, what we do for our clients and start to streamline that. So a lot of the work I was doing um, was really, uh, I had been so deep in the productization of the space and the physical space. A lot of what I was thinking about was kind of, okay, we offer a lot of services. So how do you productize those kind of services? And especially because there, those services weren't necessarily like a revenue generator themselves. Uh, it was really meant to be a compliment and kind of a add value to the furniture that Miller Null sells. And so you've, to, in order for that to be efficient, like you have to minimize the cost on that. To me, this was really an exercise in, okay, how can we be really good, but really efficient consultants? And so that was really the challenge that I had set forth. And then secondly, how do you generate additional value out of that consulting? How do, so it's not just us to the end user, like what, what does the organization as more and all get out of it? So my, my vision on this was like, okay, the productization of it obviously makes it efficient, offers value to our clients. We can, we can operate really efficiently, but secondly, you start to develop consistency on the services that you execute. So what it, what it means is you can start to gather a lot of data around what you're doing. So understanding the workplace and obviously Miller and all serves primarily the workplace. So what is happening, especially post pandemic? Um, in the workplace, how do we actually gather data points from that? How do we start to better understand what's happening and use that to actually inform the broader organization? Okay, we have actually a really clear picture on what the workplace looks like. We see what our clients are doing. We understand what they're looking for, how they're changing, what their employees are doing. Um, and so to me, that was kind of the, 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 the whole pitch on kind of the services that we were rendering. So. But like I said, to me, this was, it was a big challenge coming into this. I was a new person and trying to instill change within that. So it was, it was much more of an exercise in kind of management at that point, more than anything else, which was really, really challenging in so many ways, especially going through a merger. And I, 
going through this merger, it was kind of amazing to see like, you have people that are excited about it. You have people that are ambivalent about it. You have people that are very apprehensive about it. And then you have people that are fighting it, you know, uh, tooth and nail. And it's, it is a very different kind of thing for me to experience and think about, oh, I spend a lot of my time just ushering people through this change. Um, so it's a very different kind of skill set that I was kind of acquiring at that point and thinking through. Um, and, and to me, that is something that I wanted to have under my belt. Um, but I think the, the other thing there though, like coming from HANA, HANA was the first opportunity I had at kind of an executive level, um, moving over to Miller Knowles, kind of reinforcing that. But it, it was really hard because I, I felt, you know, found myself moving further and further away from the design work that I started my career doing and, and really know and love. So I always felt a little bit split between that. And, and, I, and I think it's really, really challenging to balance out. I was going to ask you, Andrew, actually, um, a word that keeps on coming up in our conversation that you're saying is efficiency or making things more efficient. And maybe on your last thought too, how do you see the balance between you know making things efficient versus maybe making things beautiful, making things kind of um, special? Yeah. So. I think it's it's really important not to think that they are it's a zero sum game between those two things, and I think that that's something that feels like it's been positive, especially within the pedagogy of architecture, right? Like, oh, like you grind at it to make it better, and, and like it just takes hard work to do that. But I think stepping back, having having a little bit more perspective on it, I think there are a lot of activities that are not productive. And so rather than, I'm not trying to say like, there's one way of doing anything or, or, or designing work, but I think in, in a lot of different ways, I, I'm, I'm always interested in eliminating the time that you spend on really uh, drudge work, right. That feels, isn't a good use of your design, design efforts. And like I said before, like you're spending only probably like 10, 20% of your time on the actual design of any kind of project, right. The rest of the time you're spending on like weird paperwork or doing research or finding information on products. Yeah. Or document the, the process of documentation. So to me, like, that's why I don't think it's like they're competitive with one another. To me, the, the zero sum game is really just time. And so I'm always looking from an efficiency standpoint to, to eliminate the stuff that I, I really hate doing, right? Like I hate responding to an RFI in the, in the, in the template format that I was given. And I don't even know why somebody came up with this is the template for us responding to RFIs. And so maybe I went down the rabbit hole of asking, okay, why do we do this template for this RFI? Because it's really painful for me to type out like we have a PDF, but it's not even a form PDF that I can fill out and I have to manually kind of do it every single time. Like th those are the kind of things that like I, I really enjoy kind of getting out of the way because then I know from my experience, like I would have benefited from that. And then for me, I know that the team benefits from that. So then you can really focus your time on the design work to make it beautiful, to make it more effective. So to me, the, that's why like, I, I, I want to, I want to really couch like efficiency to me is not about like, oh no, spend less time designing. It actually is about cut out all the time that you spend on everything else and actually spend more time doing the design work, the, the hard stuff that can't be done any other way. I think one other thing that I would point out to, and especially in the career shift from going on the services side over into the owner side, I, I feel this really big balance because in stepping out a little bit, right. Architectural services are, you know, what sometimes in single digit percentages of the total project cost. And so, and that's just the architectural services, right. Total it gets really expensive. The slice of the pie is so small and like thinking about what is valuable to the larger set of people that have a much more, you know, or bigger stake within this is such an important thing because I think the practice and pedagogy of architecture has been so focused on just capital D design work. It's gotten really kind of blinders up about what's valuable to a larger audience and to your clients ultimately. And I think there's this way of balancing into, that's why like, again, the efficiency of it is not just efficiency from a business standpoint it's an efficiency from like as a practice like how can i run a more successful practice right like how do i make sure that and i think this is this is the struggle like at the end of the day nobody we, we're not trained to be savvy 
business people that run a services organization out of school, like we're, we're trained to design things. So as a result, a lot of architecture firms are run pretty poorly from a business standpoint. And I think that has a negative implication then on the work that you do, because you, you take on bad projects or you work on really or projects that have to be profitable. And those are prioritized over other projects that are more interesting or more, more engaging or, or, or more innovative. And so those are the, you have to make compromises as a result of that. So that's why I really feel like efficiency within the practice is actually a really essential thing to focus on and frees you and liberates you to do the things that you're really passionate about pursuing. Yeah, that's awesome. I think that's a really clear headed perspective on a major issue in, in, in architecture and just anything dealing with the built environment. Yeah. And like so much of, I think the big challenge too is like the process of architecture right now is, is one where we have an idea, the idea gets abstracted into documentation. Those are written specifications or drawings. Right, but it's an abstraction and that abstraction is then handed over to somebody else to execute and they take that abstraction and they try to execute in field and they, they, they merge all the field conditions and, and whatever's happening out there into that at, at the same time. So there's this constant kind of translation of all those things that is actually very difficult to do well. You're, you're trying not to be overly prescriptive because that means that the documentation is just immense and then people won't read the documentation or follow it. Um, but if you make it too simplistic, then things get missed, thing, things get assumed. And I think that's really different than say the software world where the software world, what the, the work product that you produce, the code that gets written is the end product, right? When you finish writing and you launch it, that it's done there. It's not an abstraction of the product. It is the product. And I think that's kind of the the challenge right now that is so difficult to overcome and we're, we spend so much time doing it, but the, as we've introduced technology to it, it's actually become more and more complex. So the abstraction becomes more and more complex and multivalent too, right? It's, it's an abstraction on, on a 3d model now, not just two dimensional drawings and all these things, as you introduce all these specialties into it. So it's so difficult to move through this and that's why it's so expensive. It's so slow. And I, I, I just think there's probably a different model of how that works. And I think an architect is really critical in, in finding that solution because we're one of the few people that touch so many different facets of that. But that's also where I think the experience that I've had moving into different roles outside of architecture has been actually really illuminating because now I see also broadly, like from the owner or developer side, like what are they trying to achieve? Like, how does that marry into it? And actually. So what, what's the process, not just so it makes the architectural experience better, but the, all the people involved better, how does it make it better for the GC? How does it matter, make it better for, um, the owner? How do you create more value out of it? And I kind of alluded to that before, I think with the CBRE HANA work, like to me, there's a lot of arch design work and efficient design work allows that, that owner and the developer to de-risk a project. And to them, that actually carries cash value. So that means maybe they're willing to pay you more fees. Maybe they're willing to give you more scope of services around that. And so I, I, I think there's a bigger picture that we always have to consider in how we execute the practice, what we're willing to take on, and how that actually kind of uh, comes to fruition ultimately. So I guess in that vein, as we wrap, um, what changes do you hope will come to the profession? And you know, for a listener out there who might be just coming out of school getting into their, the first steps of their career? Like, what do you, what advice do you have for them? Well, just what, uh, I want to add one more point. I mean, now in 2024, it, it will probably feel like what it was in 20, 20, 2009 when you were graduating, because, you know, we're at the peak of the interest hike. There's many architecture offices laying out, laying off uh, staff, and it's, it's maybe not as hard, but, you know, similar. What would you say to them? Well, I'll, I'll tackle the second part. So if you're a student, again, what I mentioned, like, don't get overly concerned about it because uh, two, two things you, you're actually, the opportunities are most open to you right now, because it's, you, you can be really, you know, inexpensive toward an organization and you actually have the most to gain from it all because everything is a learning experience at that point in time. And I think that's the thing looking back at it, I think I spent so much time worried about, am I, am I at the right firm? Am I learning the right things? 
everything's just a learning experience. And like the, the key is only just getting as much of it as possible and absorbing as much as possible. And I think you'll figure out the narrative and how you weave it all together at a later point in time. You're, you're not there yet and it's okay. Like it, I, I would say just like, take your time, take a breath, and just absorb as much as you can. And th that means also it doesn't have to be with an architecture firm. It could be, I think, anything within the kind of AEC uh, industry is useful at this point in time. I, I think it's super valuable to to know, you know, how the trades work. Like, how does framing get put together? And if you don't understand that process, you can't actually solve design problems that are actually meaningful, right? Like, if this goes back to kind of my work around kind of standards. If I If I wrote something, but nobody would follow it, or it kind of caused problems and people didn't want to follow it, it wouldn't get followed. And so you really have to understand the process that people go through in, in kind of taking what your, your work product is and, and moving through the next step. So I think learning about the trades, learning about how things get done. So working for a developer, working for a construction company, like all of those are valuable. But I think then the, the key is like, okay, what do I want to learn next? Where do I go with this? What, what knowledge have I acquired? Um, what are the parts that of my experience that are missing? And do I, do I feel like it's necessary to kind of dive into that side or, or do I want to kind of focus on something else? So I think constantly kind of taking that step back. Okay. What do I know? What do I have expertise in? Like, where do I need expertise or, or really want expertise? Um, and figuring out those kind of steps. I think the, the first part of your question though, Libo is really hard. Like, where does it go from here? Um, that I can, I'll fully admit, like, I'm going to be incredibly speculative about this and I, I don't, I wouldn't put any too much water in it, but I, I think it's an interesting time because like I kind of alluded to before the, I think the culture broadly out, even just as, as a society has been changing around work culture. And I think architecture itself has kind of been responding and kind of moving alongside that. I don't know what that means for architecture firms and the practice though. I, I do think it's a good thing that this kind of over indexing on, you know, grind and hustle culture is probably a good thing, right? Like I, I don't think it's entirely productive, but that's, that's where I hope like being honest about and being very clear about and, and a reckoning as a result has to come out of, okay, so what value does architecture work have? broadly like where where can we insert ourselves where where can we do things so i think i'll, I'll say this like I, i'm going to be hopeful and optimistic about it what i really hope is that architects in the technology that's coming out buys back all this time and buys back all this effort so that we can do better exploration in in kind of capital a architecture but also take back a lot of territory i, I think as the building industry has gotten very complex. It's been really sectioned off into different specializations. Um, one example was like, I was working on a project recently and the, the design firm on it didn't have a scope of services for interior design and the client wasn't willing to pay for it. And so I think there's, there are a multitude of problems in that, right? Like there wasn't a perceived value in providing interior design services. And then secondly, the architect just wasn't efficient enough to provide those kind of services at a value that the, the customer that the client wanted. And so to me, that's like, it's such a miss, like no one's going to pick it up. And so it's, part of the design is going to suffer as a result of that. And so my hope is like through <laughs> that, I, I hesitate to say efficiencies now, but the efficiencies that we can create and it's going to be the opportunities that technology affords us and for the better processes and, and training, like, I'm, I'm hopeful that like architects can take back a lot of things. And like, I'm excited about the fact that I, I know so many different architects are, that are dabbling in development now, right? Like going into the construction side of things, doing design build. Like to me, that's really exciting because as you kind of coalesce these things, I think one of the big issues around the industry is because you have so many different players, everybody has kind of their own incentives, right? Everybody has to maintain their own business. Everybody has to make sure that, that their business interests are served first above other people's. And so it inherently creates kind of an adversarial relationship between everybody working on a project together. And, and it's not because of malintent or it's because the people think lowly of contractors or other consultants, or it, it just is kind of the way the, the, the contractual structure is set up at this point in time. And it, it feels very unproductive to me. So I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that 
it allows new permutations of organizations to kind of come out of this, to look at the scope of work differently, to take on the scope of work differently and find alignment within that. Because I think you're, you'll see very interesting and kind of provocative and innovative projects come out of that. And, I, and it'll be better for them. Like there's so much focus right now. And I think more than ever, I think we all recognize like the dire need for a better and more sustainable construction and architectural practice, right? Like it felt like sustainability, you know, 20 years ago was kind of an engineering exercise. It was a calculation on energy loads and those kind of things. Now I think it feels much more palpably, um, uh, I, what's the word I'm looking for? It, it, it's a little bit more pervasive now, right? It's, it's inherent within the practice. And I, it, I'm excited because like a design build firm doing that probably can be much better about it than the traditional design bid build, you know, factor, a developer that's aligned, that has internal design capabilities now and sees the value in that can probably be much more successful at that. So I, I'm really interested in these kind of, um, organizations that can broadly take on scope. But that, that said, I think there's huge challenges with that too, right? Like recently we've seen a lot of the, the implosion of a lot of manufacturing, uh, you know, uh, manufacturing companies that were like, um, Katera, for example, being vertically integrated, is really challenging, right? Like you're, you're at the whim of the economy. So I, I think it's not without its challenges, but I'm excited to see like what people can create. And I think there is a huge cottage industry of these small organizations that are coming out of that. So I'm very optimistic about that. Well, that's awesome. Be, be optimistic about the future and uh, be the change that you want to see in the architecture industry, I guess. Um, yeah, exactly. Well, I want to thank you, Andrew, for your time and so efficiently covering uh, so much ground <laughs> in this conversation. I um, want to thank our listeners out there. And if you haven't already, please follow, subscribe, and rate the Most Modern Podcast on Spotify, Apple, and soon to be YouTube and wherever you listen. And we'll be back with another episode soon. Thanks, Thanks so much, Andrew. guys.